humble ourselves to the state of dying to self completely. Until that takes place, and in love for one another, we bring the church together in an attitude of prayer, in an attitude of intercession. Until that takes place, the book of Joel says that we are facing the wrath of God, and God is pictured in the book of Joel as being our enemy, not our friend. Why? It's not because God is our friend, but it is because of our sin that have separated us from him. And so, friends, I'd like this morning to, to counsel you, to take the message seriously and to, and to do a search in your life, to turn to the Lord, not to Pastor Sam, not to the Adventist Church, but to turn to the Lord with all your heart. If they declare to you that you were dying, wouldn't you turn to the doctors with all your heart trying to find a solution for your problem? Well, do the same, but go to the Lord and seek Him with all your heart until you find Him, until you're 100% sure that you are accepted, that there is nothing between you and your God, that your account is clear, that you are holding to nothing, that there is nothing that you're allowing to separate you from your God. When you have come to that point when there is absolute peace of mind, where you have surrendered your life in completeness to God, then you can rest assured that if Jesus came, you are going with him to heaven. But tonight, uh, th this morning, I'd like us to concentrate in the positive picture. I know that when I get into the, the, the hard part, sometimes I preach hard. I preach tough. I, some people have told me that I whip them. And this, it's not my desire to whip my flock. I know that a shepherd, a true shepherd, doesn't whip his flock. But if instead of taking as if I'm trying to whip you and tell you off, you take me... Um, if I had a child of mine who's going to cross the, 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 the railway line and the train is coming, out of love, I would scream to that child, get out! You know what I mean? I'm not preaching hard because I hate you. <laughs> I'm preaching hard because I see, friends, that we are coming to the last very minute of human history. I, I, I stand in the walls of Zion and I'm warning my people inside the city, please wake up, wake up, because the army is coming. That's all my sense. If I have told you to sell your things and, uh, and to try to, you know, get, 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 get out of your debts, try to lighten the load, because soon that load will drag your feet and it's going to be almost impossible to walk. I'm not telling you to do it because I want your money. I don't want your money is God wants your heart, not your money. But the problem is that soon material possessions will become a burden so big that it will be almost impossible to serve the Lord. That's all I'm saying. And you read the spirit of prophecy, and you will find that the spirit of prophecy supports what I'm saying 100%. Dear friends, get into the internet, listen to the news, and a great economical crash is coming. One day you will remember what I said. That's all I'm saying. I'm not talking about money anymore. I've already got into trouble up to here. Let's go to verse 18. Verse 18. Verse 18. Now comes the good picture. And I can preach this sermon with a big smile. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The zealousness of God is a manifestation of his extreme love for us. You come to the book of, uh, of uh, Exodus, to the Ten Commandments. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter 20. God is a jealous God. He's zealous for us. You come to verse, uh, chapter 20 of, um, of uh, uh, Exodus. 
and verse 5. You shall not bow down to them, not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. This zealousness or jealousness of God is not a jealousness in which of selfishness, of self-gratification. The Lord is zealous for us because His love is passionate. And all these years where the church has been serving two masters, we, we want to have the world and we want to have God. The, 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 the zealousness, the zealousness and jealousness of God has been pricked. Because he wants you all for himself. He doesn't want to share you with Satan. He doesn't want to share you with the world. God wants you 100%. He longs to have you for him and for him alone. And so the Bible tells us in verse 18 of Joel chapter 2 that the Lord is going to be zealous for his land. And this zealousness is a result of his love and his jealousy for us. He is envious of those who have taken control of the land, of all the material possessions, of all the, 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 the philosophies that have come into the, the church that have dispersed God, that have taken the love of God's people and have implanted in their heart a love for other things or other people. And God he says, I am going to be zealous for you. You know what the result of that ze uh, zealousness is going to be? that God's people are going to turn to Him until they are completely passionate. Dear friends, there's only one dream that God has for His people, and that His people will love Him as much as He loves them. And the zealousness of God for the land will bring that amazing result. That God will take away all passions from our life. That God will take the desire to serve other masters and other idols will be gone by the wayside because at the end of the work of repentance and turning to God with all our heart, God is going to have a people that will love Him as much as He loves them. What a passionate love God is longing for. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and notice the next word, and pity his people. You know, there is one thing that the Bible puts about God and is this picture of God as a mother who's constantly pitying his children. If it was not for the pity of God, none of you or me would be here. True? If God would not have looked at you at your scraped knees and your elbows and your nose bleeding because you've fallen in sin, and he has said, oh, my little child, I'm so sorry about you. Come, I'm going to cure you. And he takes and cures the nose and the elbows. That is pity. Though it is our fault that we end up with our scraped elbows and our wounded souls and our wounded lives, though it is our fault, God does not repay us according to what we deserve. God gives us according to what we do not deserve. He gives us His love, His protection. He blesses us. He guides us. He gives us a hope. Amen? God is a pitiful God and the day is coming, friends, when God will be zealous for the land and God is going to be pitiful for His church. Doesn't matter how far you've gone, what you've done, how wicked you may have been, what the errors that you have committed, what mistakes you may be carrying in your conscience. The Lord wants to be pity towards you, friends. He wants to show you His pity before it is too late. The day of wrath is coming. But before the day of wrath comes upon the church, God is going to have a day of pity where all who name the name of the Lord, Joel says, shall be saved and salvation will be manifested here in Zion within the church and sinners will turn to the Lord and will be transformed and converted only if we are willing to turn to the Lord with all our heart. Amen? To humble ourselves, to recognize our nothingness, to be willing to die to self and let Jesus take control of the life. The Lord will be pitiful. 